before the top of the hour, let's get into this conversation. Now, in spite of the ruling ANC's efforts to legislate on women empowerment, we are not quite there yet. 27 years after the attainment of democracy. Well, that's according to Dr. Judy Dlamini, who is the chairperson of the GBVF Response Fund 1, as well as Chancellor of the University of the Vitvatisrand. Now, while the country marked Freedom Day yesterday, Dr. Dlamini argues that we cannot fully celebrate freedom while women are not free to even walk the streets of our country without fear. Dr. Glamini joins us now to reflect on the country's 27 years of freedom and as far as women emancipation and gender equality are concerned. Dr. Glamini, always a pleasure having you on the program. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Leanne. Thanks for having me. Good morning so, I, and good morning to the viewers. I, I read your, your, your column or your, um, your opinion piece that uh, is, is out and about and it, it, it's a very powerful piece just looking at where we are as a country when it comes to women, gender equality, and where we are as women. And basically, it's a, it's a pretty dim picture that you've painted when it comes to South Africa and women emancipation. Perhaps you want to expand a little bit further on this one. Uh, thanks very much, Leanne. Uh, I think it's important to always acknowledge what has been achieved because uh, you can't just criticize without uh, celebrating uh, part of what has been achieved. Uh, if you look at what our forebears had to contend with and the initiatives they put in place, some sacrificing even with their lives, uh, we are grateful for that. But we would be remiss uh, to be comfortable with that and hope to pass on this country as it is uh, to our grandchildren. So what am I saying then? Yes, we appreciate what has been done, but definitely before everyone is free, then we are all not free. Uh, if uh, you just you spoke about the gender-based uh, GPVF response fund, do we really need to do that if women are free? Do we need to pour money into trying to salvage women from our sons, our husbands, uh, other male uh, uh, counterparts? It just shows to you that we're not free. And uh, it's not a negative thing to bash people down, but it's a statement to say each one of us has to be as committed in gender emancipation as we were in trying to eradicate uh, racism or legislated uh, racism because we still have racism, as you know. Yeah. I'm glad we started the interview by basically looking at some of the positive strides because, because there have been. There have been many positive strides that have come in these 27 years. I mean, you outlined some of the, the issues and the demands where we, we, you know, we saw the, uh, the Federation of the South African Women, the FSAW, where they delivered a charter expressing the philosophy and the demands and the, the aims of, of what it is that women should achieve. And when we look at all of them, I don't want to read through all of them, and, and many of them have been achieved, but it's quite incredible that it's almost as if by achieving some of them, we have sacrificed so much more. And I think the sacrifice comes in the fact that the safety of women is one of the biggest issues that we need to look at. Um, a, a woman walking alone in South Africa is possibly one of the dangerous things one can do, and, and it doesn't make sense. Let's, let's start on some of these issues. We do not want to belittle how far we've come, but we've still got a long way to go. So let's, let's talk to the safety of women, and particularly gender-based violence. Uh, Lian, gender-based violence is really about power dynamics the inequality of women, a culture that makes women feel less and are actually reminded by so many things around them that they are less is what is at the core of gender-based violence and femicide. And, uh, you know, we talk about the National Strategic Plan with the six pillars that actually was very well considered to say, what are the six big areas that we can tackle to try and address gender-based violence. But you know as much as I do that the culture is what drives behavior. Mm. And the culture is the most difficult thing to change. And because it is, it requires each and every one of us to try and do something to change the culture, all sectors. So that's why for us, 
we look at all sectors of civil society, business, uh, government, to say what role can each one of those play? I want to state though that it always helps if there is leadership at the top that is committed to the change. And the president has shown that he's committed to the change. Gender-based violence is a national crisis. The launch of the fund is an initiative to say, private sector work with us to try and solve the problem. It's going to be a long journey Mm -hmm. trying to solve the problem because at the core of it is a culture that tries to push women down. At the core of it is lack of recognition of the initiatives and the contributions made by women. And it starts there. Just celebrate what women have achieved. Celebrate what they bring to the table. Pay them what they are worth, not pay them less. So there is so much sexual harm uh, that is brought by the inequality, which is based on the mindset. If you just look at all the policies uh, that the government has come up with, which uh, I commend uh, the current government for doing that. However, as business, it's about the mindset. If the government is going to come up with policies and all we do is tick boxes, even hire consultants to make us look good, PR, legal compliance is very different from change in behavior, from embracing diversity. We actually need to have activism by shareholders because it's been proven by so many uh, scholars that if you have diversity that is embraced, a culture that embraces difference, it's innovative, the bottom line improves. So a lot of people lose just for us to keep this gender supremacy uh, of men. So I I think it's, it's upon each and every one of us actually. Yeah, and, and it's, it starts from s- such a, a young age, and that that that's the reality. I mean, I've I've often uh, watched on and see, you know, I, I have a son, and I see him playing sporting activities or doing something, and you know, they may do something that uh, they may be playing whatever get, sport it is and hit the ball out or or drop something or or do something, and you know, and then you'll have a sports coach or somebody just saying, "Oh, stop playing like a girl," or "Stop being." Um, like a girl. And you know, these are the kind of things that manifest themselves in a young mind. And then, I mean, and that, that is one example of hundreds that happen everywhere. I'm picking on the most simple example. And of course, this just grows and grows and grows. And it creates this understanding that women are not strong enough, women are not good enough, women cannot do it as well as men can do it. And, and everything you're talking to starts resulting in this. So it doesn't really matter at the end of the day if you've got the policies in place, but if that mind shift doesn't take place, nothing will ever change. You know, you are so correct. Uh, When you mentioned that, I remembered an encounter I had at the gym where men were talking to themselves. Are you lifting like a girl or, you know? It's just those things that uh, we need to change. Again, I would like to commend the government because I see that they are now starting the Department of Basic Education, uh, introducing sexual um, uh, harassment uh, into the curriculum at early childhood. Just a child talk on what's right and what's wrong. And uh, a conversation that expects the best of a person, regardless of gender, Because physical strength doesn't mean overall strength, you know. We might not be strong physically. So generalization, obviously, some women are stronger than women physically. But still, that's not the only measure of a person. As a country, as society, we must mold our youth, our children, to be the best they were meant to be. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Regardless of gender. You obviously sit in very powerful positions. I mean, you're, you're both, you're in business. You're um, also, a ho- and the question I'm going to ask you is related to, to being, um, you know, part of a university and also seeing the dynamics that are taking place. Obviously, there, 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 there are still the battles and the struggles and we talk to gender-based violence and we talk about those issues that we do struggle with on a daily basis. However, when you look at the young girls that are coming through the ranks, 
my sense is that they, they, they're not going to take this anymore. That this generation, they want change. They're demanding change. But are they demanding it enough? Because it is up to them. We, we need to change this. But when you look at these young girls that are coming through, they're choosing subjects and, and I imagine degrees that were never, ever meant for them, you know, because it was the mm. perceived male degree but, or, or male way of life. But things are starting to change. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing the rumbling? Uh, I am. And uh, the only uh, divergent view that I have in terms of that we need to help them. I always yeah. talk about intergenerational conversations and how. You know, we need to pass the baton as we run alongside with them. I try, Leanne, to walk the talk. Uh, on the 12th of May, I'll be launching what we call Female Academic uh, Leaders Fellowship. What does that mean? Developing a pipeline of academic leaders who are women especially black women, because they are the most disadvantaged, the most overlooked. What will that achieve? Over and above, just changing uh, the complexion and gender at leadership level, those become the role models. People tend to emulate people who look like them. When they don't see people in positions of power who look like them, they're discouraged. They look elsewhere. Mm. So my message is, Let's do something, each and every one of us, wherever we are. You don't have to wait to be in leadership. Wherever you are, you are a leader, and you can do something to change the status quo. And let's work across generations, across races, which is, you go back 67 years ago, those women were across race, and they were across religious groups, and so forth. So we have it in us to work together, to change the status quo. Because if we do, everyone will benefit, not just women. Yeah. You know, you further go on to talk about it during the liberation struggle, uh, the struggle saw no gender and that everybody came together to ensure that the freedom was achieved with many people losing their lives in the process of doing this. Uh, at the same time, a lot, of, a lot of men may have gone off, but women ran, the, you know, they, they kept the cause going, they kept the flame going. And I know you speak to that a lot. But I want to just wrap up the interview and talk to the, the words that you close off your article with, which I think are very, very important and something we need to talk about as we, 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 we look at freedom and what Freedom Day means and, and, and there cannot be freedom without gender equality. You quote the words of um, United Nations Women Executive Director Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nuka, who of course was also one of our, our past Deputy Presidents, basically in a nutshell saying achieving gender equality is about disrupting the status quo, not negotiating it. Equality for women is progress for all. And, and that is important. It is disrupting what's happening mm. currently. Perhaps you want to just end on that and, and, and tell us how we do that. What is it that we can do as women and the youth to do exactly what you're saying? Uh, you know, I see men as allies. I see youth as allies. I see everyone as allies. LGBTQI community, disabled people. I think together we can work to disrupt it. It can't just be women. Yeah. It can't just be youth. It has to be each and every one of us. I, I do believe that's the way to, to end this, that uh, wherever you are, you know, they talk about uh, sexual harassment as an example, and they talk about people that uh, observe. Those people have the power to disrupt because they must call out the people that are doing that. So it's not just... Uh, the problem of the person who's a victim of uh, unfair practice, but it's the people who observe it. And if you observe it and do nothing, you are an accomplice. So each time uh, you see something that is wrong, don't say it has nothing to do with me because guess what? It does. And the generation that you breed will actually inherit that toxic way of looking at things and toxic way of treating women. And it has to stop. Dr. It really has to. Dr. Judy Damini, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very, very much. And I'm glad we're speaking about this, not in a closed room at a women's event, because that is exactly what you're talking about. That's so Break, true. <laughs> break the bubble. 
because when we're talking to each other, we're trying to um, uh, turn the converted. We, we're okay. Preaching to the converted doesn't work. Everybody needs to help. So thanks again, chairperson of the GBVF yes, Response yeah. Fund One, as well as the chancellor at Wits University, talking to us about gender equality and uh, all of this amongst Freedom Day, which was celebrated yesterday. All right, let's uh, have a look at.